I asked longevity expert Aubrey de Grey if he thinks Brian Johnson will live to be 120 or even 150 years old. It, this will not get him to 150. It won't get him to 100. Brian Johnson is a tech entrepreneur turned biohacker on a mission to live to at least 120 and maybe even forever. Through his blueprint protocol, he follows an ultra-optimized lifestyle backed by relentless data tracking, making him the most measured human on Earth. His biomarkers uh, from heart health to biological age are among the best ever recorded, possibly making him the healthiest person alive today. But can his lifestyle really help him live beyond 100 years old? Let's explore this together with Aubrey de Grey, the inventor of the term longevity escape velocity. And so what if you look at uh, the individuals, for example, who are participating in, I think it's called the rejuvenation Olympics, like Brian Johnson, for example. So, for example, I think he says he's quite confident that he will live to his 150. So it's not clear to me whether he believes that would be including tech that will be available uh, when we have longevity escape velocity or whether that would be alone with kind of the data and his habits. Uh, are you aware of that? Honestly, I'm getting a bit frustrated with Brian. Um, I know him quite well. And he's, he, you know, he says wonderful things about what we're doing. Um, and I certainly believe that he is, you know, making a big contribution to raising awareness and enthusiasm for doing things about aging. But he isn't being at all logical about, um, about this whole thing. He's not, for example, putting any of his own money into research. He's putting it all into, um, you know, his own treatments and, and disseminating these, you know, improvements in what we, in how to use what we can do already. And he must understand because everyone's told him that this will not give him, uh, you know, this will not get him to 150. It won't get him to 100. You know, I mean, the fact is he must know that. I'm looking forward to getting him to come clean, so to speak, with regard to the question you're asking. Can you explain to me, um, I mean, I know there are different ways to measure biological aging, right? And when you look at these rejuvenation Olympics, to me, it seems like you have some people who, according to, to uh, that website, only age with the with a speed of 58% or, so, or something like that. Um, and it also seems that some people have become younger biologically by changing habits. So let's say you had a biological age like at 50 and then you do everything right and suddenly it drops to, to 45. Um, do these results make sense or are we more kind of tricking ourselves to believe we're becoming younger? A good question. It's a very important question. Of course, the um, wonderful thing for our work at LED Foundation is because we're working in mice, we don't have to worry about any of this. We can just measure longevity and, and we're done. Of course, we are measuring all manner of different aspects of health as well. Uh, but honestly, the acid test of longevity is always going to be the thing that matters most in terms of convincing people that we've made progress. And um, we can do that. Whereas, of course, with, with humans, we can't because it takes too long. So, yeah, so the measures of biological age that are so fashionable right now, these epigenetic clocks and so on, still have a long way to go to be really validated, I believe, at least. Um, at the moment, what we have is clocks that can um, not only tell you how old you are chronologically, which you already knew, um, it can also, to some extent, tell you how soon you're going to get sick. Uh, so, in other words, there is some degree of um, um, measurement of biological age. However, what we need, and really do not have yet, is um, clocks that robustly reflect um, the impact of interventions. And here I don't just mean... Um, you know, high-tech interventions, stem cells or plasma exchange or whatever. I mean, um, lifestyle interventions, anything. Um, at the moment, you know, there's just not been enough data. Uh, we've got plenty of, um, you know, data on varieties of, a variety of different people, lots and lots of people, 
but it's just going to take a long time to gather data on um, people who have been availing themselves of different interventions and um, seeing what happens to their biological age as measured by these things like epigenetic clocks or whatever. At the moment, therefore, I believe that the gold standard for a biological age is the same as it ever was. In other words, we, are, we should measure um, functional uh, things, you know, uh, physiological things like grip strength and, you know, treadmill performance and so on, and cognitive things, of course, as well, uh, you know, memory, such like, um, which definitely, you know, people have got pretty good at identifying ways to measure these things that are reflective of age, of biological age, uh, because they do actually change at a respectable rate well before people exhibit any anything that would be called a disease of aging. Um, and, um, you know, I don't, I don't have an uh, encyclopedic knowledge of how um, the biological age is being measured in these rejuvenation Olympics, um, but I would say that, that, that things like that are what should be getting measured. Now, to come back to your question about... Um, bona fide rejuvenation as a result of, you know, living, living right or whatever. I think we, I, I definitely do not want to, you know, downplay that. I think it's very uh, important that people should do their best to keep their biological age as low as possible and have it increase as slowly as possible. Um, and so people may think, well, hang on, I thought that damage repair was the only way you could, um, reduce your biological age, and we can't do that yet, uh, to speak of. So this is a little subtle. We have, of course, built into us a um, huge arsenal of automatic built-in damage repair machinery that um, you know, eliminate damage as, the, as metabolism generates it. And the kind of damage that we automatically repair I do not even include in my definition of damage. I only include things that we don't have machinery to repair and that we need to develop medical machinery to repair instead. Um, uh, but it's there and it accumulates. And um, it accumulates in a, um, you know, in a manner that is not necessarily optimized, you know, because the body doesn't really care about living beyond the point where it's done um, reproduction. So, uh, essentially, if you um, do things that might not necessarily be called damage repair, but they are good for you, like, you know, you lose weight or whatever, then you are somehow, you know, you are taking the pressure off these various damage repair um, mechanisms that we already have built into us. And that means they will work better. So, you will see a rather widespread um, you know, rejuvenation by some measures um, as a result of things like just getting into a better state of fitness. Um, but whether you would, whether we should call that bona fide rejuvenation in the sense of reducing your biological age, you know, it's questionable because you really shouldn't have been overweight in the first place is really what I'm saying. But... I mean, if if I understood uh, Brian Johnson correctly, for example, what he said is, there's never been a human in history like me before because I measure everything and I, I adjust to whatever is perfect. So if there was a lady who could lift till she's 120, you know, I should be getting 20, 30 extra years because of that optimization. And, and that is kind of what you're saying. That is not happening because the body is not built for that. Well, it's more than that. Um, the first thing is that Brian is not built like Jean Carmel. Um, You know, first of all, he has a Y chromosome. Uh, you know, men tend to live less long than women in the first place. Secondly, uh, there are all, many, all, all manner of other genetic differences between Brian and Jean Carmel um, that, you know, are, pro are by and large going to be life shortening because Jean Carmel was selected, you know, was the one person who had the right genes as well as uh, presumably getting a lot of other things right. Um, against that, though, 
The fact is, if the world were constructed, were, were populated entirely by people who had exactly the same genetics and the same life history as Brian Johnson, then he'd be absolutely right that, um, you know, the fact that he's doing such an enormous amount of measurement and adaptation of his regime in response to those measurements is an extremely good thing. And, you know, if, if there's one thing that I would take away, I would say we should take away from what Brian is doing as a lesson to all of us is that, is that measurement is really, really important. And actually, you know, in some ways, um, it's easy not to do that. It's easy to look at what Brian is doing, you know, his regime and everything and say, oh, I should just have that regime. That's nonsense. That's not what Brian is really telling us at all. He's telling us, find out what works for you. And different things work for different people. So he talks about sleep an awful lot. Now, there's no question sleep is really important. You've got to have enough sleep. But what he talks about is more than that. He talks about sleep schedule. He has, uh, he places a huge emphasis on getting the same amount of sleep at the same time a day, every day. In fact, there was a long period of time when he simply w refused to do any travel that involved crossing more than two time zones because of the disruption. And um, yeah, he's, he's relaxed that now. He's, you know, he's it just, it's like there's, there's too much to do. But um, he used to do that. Um, and he found you know, that's because he, you know, through all the measurements he was doing, he found that that was important for him. But honestly, that sleep schedule rigidity is um, much less important for a lot of other people. So I, for example, you know, I definitely need my sleep, but if I have it disrupted because I do a lot of, you know, intercontinental traveling, um, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't affect me. Uh, partly it's because I don't get jet lag. You know, that's just luck really. Um, and also I can sleep really well on planes, you know, so some people can't, I mean, most people can't. So yeah, different things work for different people. And that's really what Brian is emphasizing when he says measure, measure, measure. So just to kind of sum up uh, this part of the discussion, we, it does seem that certain habits does delay biological aging, but we are not sure by how much because we're not certain about the accuracy of, of the measurements, correct? Um, we're not sure by how much because we're not sure of the accuracy. And also we're not sure how to define it. So as I said, you know, it's rather questionable whether um, the impact of of losing weight should be counted as you know within this within this framework. But uh, the the reason why people tend often to do so is because there are these indirect knock on effects on the whole of our metabolism on things that really you know feel feel like they ought to be included. And it's the same with stress. You know, if you have a stressful life and you um, you're not good at handling stress, uh, that's definitely life shortening. It, you know, it has um, an impact on stress hormones like cortisol, of course, and these have effects throughout the body. Um, so if you can adjust your life or your simple, your response to stress, you know, just be more chill, then it's going to be good for you. Um, but again, is that really changing your biological age? By some definitions, yes, because it's changing things in your physiology. It's changing the, the rate of accumulation of damage. Um, but, you know, other people would say, well, this is just lifestyle. It's not really changing your age. So can Brian Johnson live to 100, 150, or even beyond? Well, if you ask Aubrey de Grey, the answer is twofold. With today's technology and Brian's blueprint program, Aubrey doesn't think he'll make it to 120 or 150. In fact, due to his genetics, he might not even reach 100. But here's where it gets interesting. Aubrey also believes there's a 50% chance that by the late 2030s, longevity technology will be so advanced that we'll hit longevity escape velocity, where we can rejuvenate our bodies faster than we age. And if that happens, Brian Johnson could absolutely reach 150 or a lot more. After all, in just 15 years, he'll still only be around 60. What do you think? Can Brian Johnson really make it to 150? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the bell icon so you never miss an update.